it's a question of shared leadership again. Um, what I did not mention, uh, we will have that with the, in the theater metaphor. What I did not mention is that usually leadership, at least as far strategic leadership is concerned, means creating something new. Uh, a thought that somebody who is able, has designer qualities, can think of good ideas how the future can be and construct the ideas and may have a good idea with what kind of resources could we reach what in what time. And this is in theater metaphor, the person who writes a script for the play. And certainly the script must be written in a way that you can play and learn to play it with the resources available, not just something. So designing means not drawing in the sky something. And if the script is lousy, it's not easy uh, to have a good performance. Sometimes you have players and a group process that still something interesting is coming out. I'm not saying this is not possible, uh, but it, not, it doesn't happen so often. But if you have a good script, uh, even mediocre players, when they understand how they should play together, can learn very quickly and do a good performance. And because we do not have so many genius, we should have good scripts. But the quality, the designer quality is something different than the director's quality of the play. Because the director should be able to understand the script and communicate to people. So the first quality is to be a communicator and create a culture of communication and mutual adaptation and learning and understanding the individuals who play their roles there. And unfortunately, most of the time, these two competencies are not assembled in one person. So this is why it's a good idea uh, to have in, at least in the leadership of a strategic unit uh, both qualities. If they are in, integrated in one person, fine. If they are not, it's not that the person is not competent enough. The person just is competent in some dimensions and needs to complement him or herself by others who have the other qualities. And if uh, and very often, uh, by experience, this happens that we have a leader and a co-leader, and somehow these two have these this role differentiations. Uh, sometimes it's also possible that the leader is, uh, is mainly a designer, but he knows his weakness about directing. Then he has to bring up a culture of uh, self-direction and maybe bring in consultants who help to build up that culture because he might be inspire people but not be able uh, to build up this uh, self-steering culture within them. Or a person uh, is, a, is a good um, relationship-oriented leader, but uh, if he's honest with himself, doesn't have ideas. And this is something we are ashamed about. If, if we think if you are a leader, then you should, have, should be a designer. But most are not. And that's not for shaming. <laughs> because both qualities are important, but if they are not a designer, they should confess, I'm not a designer, I can help you. Uh, uh, I, I lead you to have uh, by relationships and look at you, and with the designing quality, we must somehow find how we integrate it. And then maybe external services may come here or whatever. So um, we not, do not automatically attribute 
with the role of leadership also qualities we need as a leading qualities. And re a responsible leader, no matter what his one-sided talents are, is responsible uh, for uh, complementing himself. And there are many ways how this can be done. Because the one-sidedness, if it's lasting too long, and the context conditions get bad, uh, lead to problems. And when then they uh, are try to be solved with the same one-sidedness, then you enter a, a vicious circle and end up in dilemmata. So this is one. And when I <laughs> I was um, asked, isn't that we have already wonderful leadership models, for example, in the family? Why not transferring them into companies? I said, yeah, we have, families are different as well, but we have some experience in shemata and they are culturally defined. But we, this is a one-sided and small picture, and we should not try to uh, insert the big picture I tried to draw here into that known draw, uh, small picture. Because the uh, so, uh, outcome should be that you uh, respect your given small picture and you get ideas about the bigger other parts uh, that can be complementing the whole picture um, and find ways to go for that. And then I was asked, okay, uh, the re reaction was, yeah, maybe I do that because I do not know what to do tomorrow with what you said here. And I said, it might not be so complicated. You can do really simple things. For example, next time if you, th if you think that you have a leadership problem of any kind, do not look at one person. but look at a relationship. What is the relevant relationship where the leadership problem is uh, coming up? And then uh, think about the relationship from both sides or do something so that there will be dialogue between those who are concerned, context-specific, role-specific. And this will make a difference automatically. Or next time, when you think you have a team problem or a team task to fulfill, um, just use the notion of what are the actual most important questions to be answered. And then ask yourself who then should be in this first step beyond the stage and in which roles. And then talk to them what your idea is about the questions to be answered right now, whether these questions are shared by others. And if they are shared, ask them whether they think they are the right people to be on the stage for that question, and how they do understand their roles uh, and their way to respond and everybody his or her own roles or and the roles of others. Besides having a picture about myself, do I have a picture about how it goes together with the others? And if you focus your communication, you, you put together these people, and you focus your communication that way, you will automatically come to all these um, complex considerations uh, we are discussing here. So it's, it's, it's not so complicated to start with, but certainly, uh, it's, a, it's an endless big picture. You cannot grasp everything on one step. It's, I'm now 68. I needed more than 40 years to come to this picture. Okay, now I want to outline a bit, uh, uh, not, not the last book, but the, the book of last year. This year we brought out a different book. is on systemic organizational development. 
And these are some of the, this, this is outlining a bit the approach we had there. <coughs> I don't know whether you know the discussion about the sociologist Niklas Luhmann. Uh, we have uh, approaches to organizational development that is saying we are not thinking in people, we are thinking in processes. And they say people are the surrounding four processes. This is theoretically very interesting, but I can't think so. That's not very much human to think that way. Um, there are people who approach OD by I'm thinking in structures. And after we have arranged all good ideas about structures and processes, then we can think about people. Yeah, McKinsey and many others do like this, and this is a valid approach, but usually has a problem that the scripts that is designed that way will not find a director and will not find players to make a performance out of it. Our approach to OD is that systems are systems of people. So system of humans. And then you have the question, um, if you are, sometimes I get the reactions, if I try to understand every human being in my organization, I am lost. This is endless. And I say, certainly. You don't have to understand all in the background of their organizational roles. But you can understand humans within their roles. And you know to, eat, to the way they fill their roles, there are a lot of backgrounds for which, if they are not in the organization, you are not responsible and not competent to deal with. But you must know there are these backgrounds and sometimes they behave uh, because of influences of the background you don't know and this is why you have a complex system. That's a dog for you. Some dogs you understand, some dogs you do not understand. <laughs> but if the dog has a role to help with hunting, you certainly have an understanding of the dog as a helper during hunting. That's a very simple, simple metaphor. But um, So the human to be considered in an organization is the human within an organizational role with backgrounds you should consider more like professional backgrounds and things. And with backgrounds you cannot consider much uh, you only have to find some idea how to deal with when they appear in the role behavior. And you might find ways to deal with role behavior which are very tolerant, integrating influences from backgrounds that you do not understand. So you have to have a culture that is not too sensible uh, for diversity. This is the same thing, vice versa. <clears throat> I say, a, a coach in training is saying to me, see, uh, the organizations are so complicated, and I'm, I'm a psychologist. Um, when I expect myself to understand each organization I try to do a service to, I'm totally uh, overstressed. And it's like, you don't, no, you don't have to understand anything. That's the same vice versa. You only have to understand some of the context you are working with. And you know there are background influences from spheres you do not know about or you are not competent to judge. And that's the same. So it's a question, how much organization from the perspective of a human being and how much human being from the perspective of the organization. And certainly, we have to find here limited considerations, otherwise it gets too complicated. But again, this is not a fixed idea how much of each. 
maybe in an NGO in the midst of Africa, uh, there will be a totally different constellation as in uh, a McDonald's shop here in Chennai. So this is, again, it's an abstract idea, uh, how to think about what you need to know and what on each side needs to be considered. Uh, you only can specify it in a specific situation. So without a specific situation, you cannot say more about that. <coughs> Is that understandable? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I, maybe I cannot do more about that now. So OD means to develop system of humans. And so from the process, if we are asked to do some OD in an organization, our approach is um, at first find key figures within the organization who are ready to take responsibility on the side of the organization. And if we don't, key figures who, have, who are competent and mighty enough to do something in the field of organizational development we are invited to, then it doesn't make sense that we try to start. We can start, maybe, but then we have to downsize the expectations, what we can do. We only can do maybe something on one island, but we cannot do something on the whole archipel. So, um, because if as a consultant, from outside or and even a consultant from inside, if you don't have uh, in enough competent and responsible and influential uh, mighty person on the other side, the chance that you can reach anything is very, very little. What you can then do is say, okay, I'm sorry because we are not in the stage that we can begin an OD. And obviously you are somehow not aware what you need to solve the problem you want to solve. So maybe for the first phase, I can you give a coaching specifically on that point to understand your context and what you can do within your role and not want to do something much too big from a role that is not powerful enough, but to find access to people who have, are powerful enough and the focus is on strategies to find these people, not to replace them. And if this is not possible, I help you to mourn and see what you can do when you cannot do what you illusionary hoped you can do. And this is at least a contribution to maturity of a professional, because part of maturity uh, is being able to judge what is possible and what is not possible, and this is certainly specific to a context and to a role and to a matching. Now we are back to the equation. The so second principle, so we call this crystallization principle. Maybe this comes later. Uh, we always, we do not set up a big stage. We are first set up a very small stage, but with uh, important figures that have a chance really to bring in designer competencies and director competencies for the play they think they should develop. And what is, I don't have to explain that further, what is written as a second point, OD certainly is combined with cultural development. I don't know how to do OD without integrating all these factors that are cultural factors, learning culture, leadership culture, uh, how to deal with money, with time, uh, how to respect each other, and all these things. And uh, because, as I said very often, these days culture defines whether it can be really played in a moving way, you cannot develop uh, a, a, an organization without developing an according culture, because the culture carries 
the everyday life of the development you want. So what is very clear now after I've talked so a lot is that um, you cannot define ways to do it. How to formulas. Many do, and we already discussed that it's, it's a shame if a formula that works somewhere is now uh, offered as a, a formula for everywhere. This just doesn't work. Every, if you think only a moment on it, you, it's clear that it cannot work. And still it's interesting why they have written so many books in that way. And bought, even bought. I don't know why that. So, what we do is more defining principles, uh, attitudes, perspectives. For example, one of the perspectives is uh, make a, a difference between strategic and everyday leadership, or making a difference between designer competence and communication competence as leadership dimensions. So we, we define which perspectives, which principles to think about, to find out answers specifically, are useful according to our experience. But we do not say these are the answers and you can use them everywhere. Uh, and you can have many, many principles which are ours uh, within what I uh, said these days there have been included many, many principles. I will outline some more um, soon. And certainly from the approaches we work with, uh, approaches to develop strategies, approaches to learning along with OD, approaches uh, to, to develop culture, we uh, select those methods which are suitable to develop a self-multiplying learning organization. This is one of the reasons. I was a, um, a, a family constellation uh, professional for, for many years. We worked with families with psychotic back background. And this might be a, a powerful tool if the context is suitable. But I never work in an organizational context or in a training context for professionals with Constellation. In a training context, I sometimes work with it to teach people how collective intuitive adaptation process function. But it's not not with the purpose that they should use constellation within their organization. What we work with a lot is, for example, collegial dialogues. So learning, how to set up learning dialogues, because you can do that anywhere, everywhere. And even if you are not a trained psychologist or communicator, if you have practiced a lot learning conversations within a two years program as we offer it, or one, even a one year's program if you have a basic education in that direction, um, then you are able to teach, to direct others and teach others people and make designs how this could be fitting in your organization. So we select only methods that are useful for being multiplicated within organizations because if you offer methods that uh, need a lot of expertise and extra support from outside, as soon as you want to roll out through the whole company, it's ruining the company. So, except you have really good reasons, don't use approaches that even if they will be successful, they ruin the original purpose. Some people do it because they never think about uh, what the consequences would be if they would be successful with their culture they bring to a company. This would change the culture in a way the company could not survive. Even at certain points, they might be 
embracing consequences. But still, the responsibility is not to mislead these people in the concepts how we can uh, develop ourselves as an organization. Now, these are some examples for principles. And this is, these are heuristics that uh, came out just uh, from our own practice and how we teach it and from many, many supervisions. Uh, and in that book, uh, we also asked several well-known specialists about their heuristics. And then they have a list of other principles that work fine. Sometimes, because they are, have a different language, they have different orders, different names for the same things. Sometimes they put questions in the foreground that we would not put in the foreground uh, and put us in the background. So it's um, um, a universum of possible principles. There's or again, there are no right principles. There are only successful principles and maybe ethical principles. So, for example, I said this all already uh, on the topic leadership. One of the predominant uh, tasks of leadership is setting up frames meaningful frames in which other parts of the organization can organize, organize themselves uh, and it's still working together as a whole. And interestingly enough, the clearer the frame is defined and understandable, the more people get self-organized, successfully self-organized. And if I uh, proclaim self-organization without offering acceptable, clear frames, people get lost and say do something. What will not be respected in the end because it will not contribute to a coordinated uh, entrepreneurship and, and performance of a company. So, when we do uh, something what we call OD, then we find a potent partner and we define frames with this person. What should be done this time? Does it make sense to us what this person tries to do? Does he think uh, at the f in the first step at the right roles, qualities and persons to include in order to build a development team and so on? So we cli clarify contracts, what do they expect from us? And we have to clarify these contracts certainly with those who have the power. May if you are a consultant, you know very often you, you have a, a good shared reality with somebody who is not in power. And even if you, you are successful at the point where it should be integrated into systems that is guided by power, it may be just destroyed. So you have to, you should not be, you should not neglect power. You need to integrate power because otherwise you, you can try a revolutionary approach but I do not know about many revolutionary approach that are successful. The problem is that very often those in power you think are not competent or are not the, do not have the right mindset that fits yours. This might be. But if this is the case, you have to think about what you really can do. Maybe the matching between you and the company doesn't work. Or you, your first step must be to invite those in power for the, for the enterprise you want to do with them um, into a communication and they will change. And this has also this has to do, for example, uh, with the marketing process. Uh, one of our teachers, who he has a consulting company of 35 people of its own, 
he, uh, he changed the relationship. He said, uh, not we want something from the companies, the companies want something from us. You only can do that if you have developed a name uh, in, in the market. And if somebody calls uh, him and says, we want to have an organizational development, or we want a team coaching, or, or they have some labels. Uh, and, you, and these labels are good because they organize marketing. But they do not say anything about what really should be done. Then they say, OK, we can do team development or organizational development, or now we have a fashion cultural development. 30 years ago, when I talked about cultural in com culture in companies, they said, do you mean concerts or what? <laughs> Today, it's very different. They, they are ready to give millions for cultural development, but sometimes in the same blind way. So, so somebody. Uh, that's good for uh, having a chance, but it's not wise for really doing something. So uh, w when uh, the person on the other side somehow seems to be reasonable uh, as a, par a contact partner, they talk about at the phone a bit about the focus, they thought about what for really. Team development, yes, but what for? What do you want to reach by that? How do you think is your situation that what, what you want to reach will be a solution for the problem you want to solve? So get a first idea about that. Think, OK, uh, who are the two or three most important people for your approach you want to bring with to, for a first discussion? Yeah, Team logic. We are building a team, so we need to focus. We will need to define who, whom do we need then and if it's not plausible, uh, the ideas the person has, because they are often very much status oriented. They think everybody, if I should be important, then everybody who has a high status should be there. But this person is not interested, is only coming to prevent that something happens that he has not in control. But this is not <laughs> a very good condition for a first step in organizational development. So, uh, and then you bargain a bit about a first try and say, okay, he says, come to us, you bring three or four people, we give you a half day, you don't have to pay anything. And I bring in, now as I know what your interest is, I guess some competencies and people from my system and we listen to you. And you tell us, and we are far away from the a pitch. We know what we want to, uh, to buy, and you have to show that you can adapt to that. Say, so, okay, and, and say, say, explain what problems they want to solve and how, which situations they think they are in. <laughs> and um, a lot of questions are asked by the consultants. And then, the consult, and then they stop and listen how the consultants t talk amongst each other, how they understand it. So they are the same figures as you see me doing here, uh, as communication figures. When I hear them say that, my impression is, and uh, to my knowledge about organizations and what I understand about the specific organizations, there is a whole range of questions that is not considered by them. And uh, do we think they should be considered in addition, otherwise what they want to do will not be successful? What is our minimum requirement to start? Certainly, also we don't know what we need, and we will find out. We want to build up a learning uh, community with them. What is the minimum that we, we think it's uh, meaningful to start with? And say, discuss amongst each other, and the other listen. And then we go back and say, as you listen to us, what's going through your mind? And so we are already in a de developmental process. And in the end, <coughs> um, the consultancy offer a contract and make requirements. And certainly, the company also thinks about 
uh, task to fulfill and there are requirements. And if there is enough matching, say, okay, let's have a first try. And so build up a prototype. Certainly we cannot do it, roll out it from the beginning. But manage often, especially if they are in big companies, international or in the campus, they want solutions that can be rolled out from the first moment on. This won't work. So uh, then uh, they organize a first prototype situation and with the important first liners for this project. And then they have a mini workshop on that. And from that point on, when they say they want to have this, they have to pay. And, and then starts something what we call a crystallization process. So if, um, if the group that is starting to work together somehow is consolidated and develops together with the consultants group a new culture, uh, how to deal with all those questions, then it's the time to enlarge the focus and to integrate more people. But not fast, then you can integrate them into this new culture. Because when they come in, if you invite 20 from your culture so far and they come in, uh, within 10 minutes they will dominate the culture and this new arising culture that is introduced by this process uh, will not have enough power because then also the bosses, they get all the triggers for their old cultures and so collapse, fall back into. So it's, it's a wise crystallization strategy you have to follow when you want to, uh, this has to do with time rhythm and all these things, uh, when you want to keep up a new culture uh, and especially in the beginning it needs much more nurturing than you ever believe because you constantly underestimate the power of habits. And this has nothing to do with motivation. It's just habits. So, this, the way we do this uh, makes clear point two, as little greenhouse as possible. Greenhouse, I don't know whether there's a general word, I only know, know it from TEA. Eric Burns said, uh, don't build up a greenhouse effect in, in psychological consulting. So things, things get very, very important as long as there is a bubble of a greenhouse only for this situation. As soon as you open it up to the real life, uh, these plants cannot survive. So, as little greenhouse effect as possible. And certainly what I said already, realistic timing. And I said the more incompetent a system is and the far they, have, they are already entangled in dilemma tasks, the more they have illusionary ideas about the, the solution and especially uh, on the time span they need and the effort they need to find an illusion. So it's very important that there is a, a confrontative discussion and they only will listen to you when at the same time they believe that you are competent and what you um, offer them instead will have, have a real chance. If they think you are illusionary then they will not hear you. I already, already talked about <coughs> prototype experiments and crystallizing, slowly crystallizing. And uh, there is a tendency, tendency to, to have the idea we have some standards and then we can roll out in the, in the whole company. But this is most of the time is not true. So very early we say, okay, let's do an experiment in an area where the chances are good. Let's not start in an area where everything is rotten because you don't have a chance there. And if it works there, 
then let's think where we can, in which direction we can roll, it, roll out it. And if the, situation, the conditions are different in other parts of the company, let's think how we can to change it or have a different approach to reach something there. And make this very clear in the very beginning so that they do not have an illusion that if when we have a successful experiment, this is the pattern how we solve everything as a company. And keep all your cultural principles in all processes from the beginning. Sometimes you think, okay, we compromise in the beginning, otherwise we will not get, get access and all these things. Yes, compromise is important as long as you know what you compromise. But if you know, don't know that and do not dare to fight for your standpoint in time, then after a while you are, you are living compromises and you even forget what is compromised. And then you are a small wheel in a standard old logic. So cultural principles have to be kept from the beginning in all processes. There's no chance if you allow an unacceptable culture to evolve, then later when you have done some successful work, you can change the culture. This is possible, but very difficult. I talked already a lot about controlling complexity. So the one thing is to accept really how complex everything is. And on the other hand, you have to reduce it to something. Otherwise, you cannot do something. And who, is, who can do that? And in what way can it be done? And there is no general solution to that. That's different at each point in time, at each point in the process, in the organization. But you should feel responsible for that and should not start processes where you could not control the complexity. Also, the complexity of the challenges, challenge is still there. And they want you, uh, invite you into the illusion that when they work with you, uh, it's a guarantee that you can deal with complexity in a controllable way. But this is an illusion. And if you don't have a partner who, who understands that and is already still doing good work also, they do not know how to deal with all complexity with, uh, with that uh, approach, then the charges, the chances are very little. And um, I all, it's, not only, it's not because I have uh, very, very high standards. Uh, there are many studies who say that more than 19% of organizational development uh, trials are failing. And billions are uh, spoiled that way. The money would not, I would not care about the money, but it's energy of people, it's uh, quality of life, it's resources, it's chances that are forgiven. And um, we usually, classically, we work with the paradigm first to some models and some training of personal skills and then do some, some transformation uh, or transfer, then do some transfer with all your knowledge. Uh, we work differently. We say, um, we set up situations where we experiment with the whole complexity from the beginning on and we integrate more knowledge and more skills. But the organizing principle is always uh, find a way to deal with the whole complexity from the beginning. And that's very different than the ac academics culture of training. And this certainly means uh, uh, for those who are psychologists and do things like outdoor training and all kinds of um, enchanting things with managers, yes, 
this might help sometimes. But it's not context specific and it's not role specific. So the transfer will be very difficult afterwards. There may be some kind of atmospherical transfer. I prefer to do from the beginning things that are context specific and role specific and give examples so there's not much transfer question. It's, it's problematic enough to integrate those who are, have not been involved since the starting of. This is transfer problem enough. And the other thing is uh, uh, check maturity or readiness of the actors and relevant parts of the organization. Um, I had in, uh, when we do OD laboratories in our uh, training sets, I, I interviewed two people who want to bring an OD case. And we, uh, we learned to do first two maturity checks before we, we set up a learning process for an OD case. And there was one woman, um, no, the sex is not important. There was one person um, that came in and it was a social, it's a social era thing. And this person um, wanted to help to introduce a new IT system to a uh, social insurance system. And this person, when we check, or ask him, did, did you ever do something like that at that size? Do you know where the risks are? If there is a problem, do you know to talk to? Do you have access to people in power and all these things? And, and he had a lot of personal experience on that. So that we said from his maturity, uh, we can, we have a chance with the open question we will deal with in the learning context that he really improves and can do his job if the uh, organization is mature enough. So we asked him, did the, the organization ever had a transformation process of their size? Yes, they already introduced something some years before. Have they been successful? Are the people who have directed this are still available? Yes. Uh, do you have, have access to these people? Yes. If there will be uh, problems in the process, uh, does, the, does the organization have habits and cultural um, uh, ideas how to deal with the problem then? Do they have an adequate understanding how long it will take and how much resources have to be uh, included. Do you have an? Un do they have an understanding how sustainable the main figures have to be with the process that he will not faint? And he almost said to all these questions, "Yes." So we came to the solution: the protagonist is at high maturity, rider. He knows how to jump, but the horse is also very well trained, and the chances are good then we have a total different situation for the following learning setting. This was in the social area. On the other hand, I had a guy who was, I guess it was Lufthansa or Mercedes, or very important, very big, huge process. And he, won, he was already in the midst of an organizational developmental process. Uh, the way he described what the process is and what he's doing was totally confusing. And when we asked him whether he ever did something like that, he said no, but he, he wrote a wonderful paper, uh, what was a pleasure for one of the bosses, and he said, well, you can write, write such a wonderful paper, then you also can uh, lead an organizational developmental process, you get the job. And he felt very good with that, and thought because he was entitled, he's also competent. There have been some problems, but now he is in our curriculum, and certainly in the next two hours we will have to catch up with his competencies. Totally lose a position for him and for us. And then we ask, so does the organization, is, is the organization mature? He says, no. Uh, uh, did they ever have a, a process of that size? 
Are you in a department who is influential enough to guide something like that? And f for most of the questions we came out, he, he cannot even tell us sufficiently what's the, situa what's the uh, maturity of the organization is because he does not have enough experience with it. For, with what he told us, and we only, or only could make a picture from his telling, the organization. him to work with him to understand what he cannot do, how he can communicate what he cannot do. And, if, and uh, it was clearly a dilemma because they have been brokers already far away and they thought they have gained already something. And when he's now becomes aware that they didn't uh, reach anything, then that's a loss. The loss is still there, but not in his mind. So we have had to work with him on dilemma dynamics, not on OD. He didn't want to have that because he thought, when I now work on dilemma dynamics, then I have to tolerate a loss because if I would not have a dilemma, then I could do it in the next two hours, fix my competency in my OD process. So these are also difficult situations, and it's good that our teachers also are psychologists, because now we have really also a psychological to be treated problem. So this is a check. And uh, by the way, this way of checking maturity, many of our trainees took to their companies. And when they <laughs> build up a new a uh, learning program or a new, new OD program, they sometimes work together, uh, checking each other's maturity and the maturity of the systems they want to write. And they make good experience with that. Maturity is always a, a shaky area because it's somehow uh, attached to personal dignity and it's wonderful if you have a learning culture where understanding that you are not mature to do something is not, is not a non, not okay thing. It's okay, okay thing to understand what I can do and what not. And it's a professional competence to be clear about what I cannot offer. This sometimes differs with the culture and the organization where everybody who has a high position uh, has is adopting the illusion that he's competent. And certainly uh, resources and means should be treated carefully so that we do not put up huge stages and for the you may know from your companies you are known uh, familiar with that they invest a lot of money in, 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 in uh, the kickoff. Huge. Carrying all the people from all the countries in one place in a castle, gives them three days, gives them parties and all that, and say, this is the future we want to have. Especially Americans love this campaign uh, approach to OD. And in some culture, it might work to some extent. I'm not saying it's totally wrong, but it's really not my style. But, but then the attention and other resources are already used, and for the rest, there's not much left. So the chances are very little that something really sustainable come, will come out of that. Yeah, I, I have only two more charts, and then I will invite you in some subgroups to talk about, and then we will uh, dialogue on that. How, how mu much time do we have until lunch? Uh, we have another 35 minutes. 30, yeah, that's wonderful. So, as you, I did not do the whole section on organizational development. I had a whole presentation on that. What is the relation? Uh, organizational coaching from 
classical, more psychologic, psychology oriented coaching to organizational coaching. What, what all that means. I left that out. Uh, but it includes a lot of what already has been developed by uh, Jarvis Boucher and his colleagues in Vancouver, Canada, who brought recently out a book, uh, Dialogic Organization Development. And as I told you already, uh, they create a new generative, uh, they create a new mindset. And they say it's a new mindset. They do not say any single thought or tool is new. And they say basically it's the same thing. It's dialogue. And you can integrate all the knowledge you have and all the many schools of organizational development into dialogues as needed, as making sense. And so that's clear that we felt familiar to each other. And this is, <coughs> this is why uh, we work together in a new network we are creating, the International Network for Organization Development and Coaching. We will have a meeting next year. And those of you who are specifically interested in this interface are invited to come to Heidelberg, Germany, 12th to 14th May. Everybody there works without fee. The only money that has to be, pardon? Every, <laughs> at this point especially, everybody who, who works there is without fee. But we have many, many seniors who give their decade old knowledge to the next generation and helps them to integrate these classical approaches. So some of the key words they are using, they are just going quickly through them. So emergent is fine, but it must be planned emergence. I called it framed emergence and designed emergence. So we need to have design and frames. And within that frames, if there is an adequate culture for dealing with emergency, emergent is wonderful. If not, I'm not sure. But we have still some people who, uh, who proclaim emergency as a general healing principle. And they wonder why the organizations do not adapt their services. I had one boss who said, I have chaos enough. I don't need you. So they are, one of the other key works, words is they have dialogic networks, so which is a relevant network at this point, and which is the adequate way to dialogue between whom on what, things we said over and over again these days. And certainly you cannot plan in advance. It will develop and emerge during the process. But this does not mean that everything that emerges will be adopted. You must have some kind of plan and frame to decide what to take and what not. And it will be iterative. So from step to step, you try to learn and draw consequences from that. So it's hierarchical. It's not only hierarchical, but it's also hierarchical. You can start anywhere. This is true. I usually say start on the top, but you, what is top? This, this has to do with the field in which you want to do something. Certainly you need somebody who has the power in this field you define. This must not be the top of the company. You also can have an, an island solution as an experiment And then you spread out what we call crystallization. Not just somehow spread, spreading out, but in a different logic spreading out. 
So this, and he has many principles and perspective they are combining to a new mindset that is very similar to the one, the mindset from our perspective I gave you these days. And he calls all the tools from the classical OD approaches, diagnostic uh, approaches, uh, diagnostic OD and other frame ramps, and they all can be integrated. But the predominant is the new mindset. <coughs> and from perspectives like this, uh, we have, uh, we are inspired, this is the last, we are inspired to more and more to understand what we are doing in, at our training institutes. So, as you remember, we train professionals uh, with various specializations in the organizational field. And so we understand ourselves as a learning island. And we set up the learning processes according to the challenges and the uh, specialities in the organizational field. So, and give uh, mini pictures of content, of culture, of role understanding according to these specializations. And then people come from work here, and the logic they, with, uh, they learn within is the same logic they can transfer to their organizations. So they do not have much of the classical transfer problems. But still, the culture, our learning culture, and the culture of the, of the company they come from may be very different. And so they have problems enough. Fortunately, we have money companies in Germany uh, which uh, send their specialists to us since years. So more and more of the specialists for the organizational development and leadership and, and HR in the organizations are infected by our culture and they built networks within their company, so they have more and more the chance without starting a new all the time uh, really to have an impact, even in a bigger company. But it takes years. And sometimes the difference is so big that these guys either uh, skip being in training with us, this happens very seldom. What happens more is they decide um, after the training to change the company or become a freelancer. And we tell the companies, don't send somebody to us for personal qualification if you are not ready to qualify his roles and his context because this is the way to get rid of him. And very often it happens. We tell them, some companies say, oh, we didn't think about that then how can we do it differently, that we keep them otherwise? And then immediately we switch a bit attention from training a person to developing a system, even a small part of the system. And some uh, say, we don't care, there are people enough, we are an attractive company, uh, we are employer number three in Germany, everybody wants to work with us, no problem. Say, okay, if it's not a problem for you and you pay for somebody to move away from you, that's, that's your problem. <laughs> but we make it very clear. So, this was so far the presentation uh, from the world of leadership, OD, organizational coaching. I think it's a good idea just to sit together in groups with three, maximum four, for 15 minutes. And I, I, when I look at your faces, I know I hit you very strong. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so to get you reactivated a bit. And in the afternoon, we will do more exercises, as I promised you. And we will more go back to the personal stuff that, is, that can be more understood also with the feelings immediately.